Hello. 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 Hi. I'm so pleased to be here. Apologies for the delay. No, no. We are very really happy to see you. And uh, again, thank you so much for agreeing to do this. Our fellows are elated. The audience are elated. And uh, really happy that you are here. So I think with that, uh, we just start the session. I don't really want uh, to waste any of your time also. So I'll start with your introduction, ma'am. Uh, for those of you who have joined. So, uh, Ms. Karuna Nandi is an advocate of the Supreme Court of India and an international lawyer. Uh, she has been described as a leading lawyer of Indian Supreme Court by the BBC, listed by the Economic Times as one of the fastest rising German leaders, famous in the corporate world for her expertise in commercial law, and one of India's most path breaking feminists by the Times of India. Ms. Nandi has led a number of constitutional cases, including those stemming from the Bhopal case disaster on women's rights tech regulation and overboard criminal provisions. She currently serves on the Columbia Global Free Speech Experts Committee and the high-level panel of legal experts for media freedom, headed by a former CGI of England and Amal Khrubi. Uh, apart from that, a little personal note on the introduction that I've been following Ms. Nandi, I think it's been two years now, um, when I first got to know about her and especially her views on women's rights. I've been literally following every interview of her and I've I've literally implemented a lot of your learnings now also um, in you know the way how I, how I practice and um, I am right now I'm trying to contain my excitement also uh, but it's an absolute honor and I literally feel like a dream right now I think I have to pinch myself uh, but uh, wonderful to have you um, this means so much to me really um, I mean sometimes I question my um, engagement that is outside courts right? Because I see my work as being very much something that furthers sort of um, constitutional as well as international basic values um, in court, but also I think in our larger communities, including our global communities, um, which is why I engage publicly. And, and it means so much to me, truly. Thank you for having me. The last time I was in, well, the only time I was in Pakistan, I was uh, doing a workshop with the Senate through the inter uh, IPU, the Interparliamentary Union and the UN, and we were looking at women's and children's rights and how to pass robust legislation on that. And really the welcome I got, uh, even then from the government, was just everyone was so warm and just so wonderful. and. Um, it's nice to come back in, in a small way, even if it's online. <laughs> Thank yeah, you. It's, it's our pleasure and our honor. Um, so I think we, we should start with the uh, program. Uh, so I did speak to you about the fellowship program and other health projects. So I'll just reintroduce um, you know, what it entails and what our fellows have done so far. Uh, so other health project is a legal and health awareness podcast and it is also introducing programs to increase and improve legal education in Pakistan. Uh, this fellowship program was primarily to train and mentor students to learn legislative drafting and policy making or to just have an understanding of it. Uh, the primary learning outcome that we are focusing on is uh, amendments to the Protection of Women Against Harassment Act 2010, which is in Pakistan, which has a lot of good loopholes. Um, so we have, as um, I did mention it earlier also, that we have taken a lot of inspiration from the Indian Act, uh, which is uh, which was passed in 2013, and there are a lot of provisions that we have um, tried to implicate in our legislation also. Um, so I will start with a question in relation to this, Ms. Nandi. Um, so how do you um, make an assessment of uh, the legal regime protecting women in the South Asian region? Uh, because there are a lot of elements of, let's say, patriarchy and misogyny. Uh, let's say it permeates in the executive, in the, in the assembly, and also um, just generally in the society. So how do we tackle that? How do you, how do you perceive that? Okay, so the last part of the question is huge, right? Um, and very interesting. Deep patriarchy is codified and baked into the law. And as South Asians, we have a common heritage of that with the IPC. Right? Now, of course, you have also other laws. You have Hudud laws. We have uh, personal laws. You know, uh, we have Hudud and Zena, we have personal laws. Um, 
you have your Sharia court. We also have uh, religious laws, whether it's Hindu or Muslim or uh, Christian, that is governs family affairs, right? um, personal affairs, family um, inheritance in particular circumstances. Now you can opt out of those religious laws in many circumstances, but um, that doesn't happen um, always. Now, let us look at the criminal laws. I am leading arguments on criminalizing marital rape in the Delhi High Court right now, right? Because at the moment, not only is it legal, but it's explicitly legal. So what it says is that rape consists of X, Y, Z, and that X, Y, Z in 2013, I don't know if you were following back, Pushpat, but that became very, really quite progressive, right? Because now in India, it's not no means no. It's beyond that. It's yes means yes. So what's the difference? It's that if somebody tries something with me and I don't protest, that is not sufficient. There has to be an affirmative yes that I want to participate in this act. That is actually what consent is about. It's uh, unequivocal. It may be expressed through words or through actions, um, but it has to be clear. And so also the definition of rape was enhanced in a much more feminist understanding of the conception, which is that it's not just penile vaginal penetration, right? It's penile vaginal penetration, yes, but it's also other kinds of penetration, whether it's through an object, whether it is uh, forcing the woman to give, uh, you know, fellatio to the man, uh, that like many different scenarios, then it constitutes rape. Now, I would have preferred that it would be a ladder of sexual assault, and that's what we had proposed, but criminalizing it, I think, explicitly and not just making it sexual, not just making it basic sexual assault was vital, you know? Criminal uh, force that outrages the modesty of the woman under section 354. And I'm only citing sections because I know we have common sections, right? <laughs> and um, so it couldn't just be that when it's something so serious and it's, uh, when it's something so invasive. And we saw cases like this. And so in that way it's become more progressive. But where is the problem that they failed to, they failed to criminalize marital rape? And um, our constitutional judgments on this are really quite clear. So we have the uh, judgment in Putiswami, right? In the Supreme Court, which is <clears throat> a massive constitutional bench. And they say that it is your and my intimate decision-making and uh, which in, is included in the right to privacy, right? Whether, and it all turns on consent. So that consent doesn't suddenly evaporate. It is not given away well, because I am married or because I said yes to one act. That yes has to apply to all the subsequent acts under the criminal law, right? If it applies to conspiracy, why should it not apply to something as serious as this? In India, we have a conviction rate of about 27%, it sort of hovers around 25 to 27%, right? This is, may appear incredibly low, but compare it to the conviction rate in the UK, which is about 3%, 3%. The last time I looked at France, this conviction rate is at about 7%. The reason it's a little bit higher in um, over here is because the weight that is given to the woman's testimony is significant. So that if the woman's testimony is seen to be of sterling quality, which means that she is believable, she is consistent at the FIR stage, at the 164 stage, at the uh, uh, when she gives her statement to the magistrate, um, at the trial stage where she's cross-examined by the other side, because obviously that has to happen, it has to be fair. Um, 
and if her testimony is still credible then solely on the basis of that testimony the person can be convicted um when we speak about marital rape one thing that i was startled to learn was that more than 90% of uh rapes happen in the context of marriage more than 90% right intimate partner violence and of course you talk to people and they say acha aisa bhi hota hai you know that oh i can be married to someone and that i can also say no you know a lot of people don't it's not that that idea of your body your consent is not completely widespread in our societies in south asia um however i cite the example of pakistan and of nepal because in pakistan marital rape is not legal as far as i know it has never been used you know but that perhaps is a task that one of you or all of you could take on and of course we would support in every way that we can with all the international case law that we have um i think this happened at the time that the hudood laws were repealed you know that some of the hudood laws were repealed um that at the uh, concerning rape and at that time they didn't bring back in the criminalization of marital rape the the uh, the legality of marital rape because here the exemption is explicit so now whether it was a slip of the legislative pen history is made from the slips of the legislative pen how did it come into the law in the first place there was a man called lord hale who sort of dreamt it up basically you know in england and from england it traveled through colonialism to south asia it traveled through colonialism to the united states from the united states it came to the philippines and many of these countries have systematically one by one by one repealed the law right um victorian england also did so uh, i think as late as 1993 um uh, victorian england brought in the law and then england repealed it as late as 1993 right so what is this what does all of this mean i think all of this means that when you that there is an overhaul that is required and that overhaul should come from the legislature because i think our polities should be saying that we will not because our polities concern women and our polities should be saying that we will not stand for such violence being explicitly condoned we will not stand for patriarchal laws unfortunately this isn't the way that our systems work because patriarchy is hugely embedded everywhere in um our parliament 11% of the representatives are women now only 7% were given tickets in this is the 2014 figures only 7% were given tickets um and this is the index of actually political party patriarchy because far more people and three you know and that 4% number is a huge amount in a country like india where the numbers are so big right um they won at a higher proportion than they were expected to win you know um they won at a higher proportion than than the men who had tickets because only 7% were given 11% actually won right so where does that leave us i think that leaves us in a few places one is that i think there need to be extensive movement and pressure to bring women representatives into law making um to regardless of what their gender is and not just women i think women trans people people across the board people of um, any sexuality or gender the second is that regardless of who the person is the person is meant to represent everybody and so the pressure must be brought on representatives to make such laws um we are lawyers however and i speak to, to this because you know you're involved some of you are involved in legislative drafting 
in 2013 what i realized is that the negotiations that happen at the legislative drafting stage are very important and there's a lot that can be brought in at that stage you know um how you go about it is important because there was um, and please correct me if i'm wrong this was a while ago but i saw an example of law reform from pakistan where you had GOTV brought together a, uh, a group of religious leaders and only religious leaders to discuss whether discriminatory, whether the rape laws and sort of some of the problems with Hadood were handed down by God or wrongly codified by man. And the conclusion that they came to was that it was wrongly codified by man. Now, at the time, there was a lot of protest that why do you only have these men and why do you only why don't you have any feminists on it and why don't you have you know, but actually, it was a very useful thing to have done, because that in a sense laid the ground for the law reform that then followed. Um, I also presented uh, so this example and uh, many others to, you know, when to the Supreme Court in the Maldives and to the Attorney General's office when I was working with them and to the organization of the OIC in the Organization of Islamic Conference in um, Egypt. And there are lots of progressive examples of lawmaking, even interpreting Sharia. Um, from countries, not from a purely academic feminist perspective, but actually taking examples from other countries. So while it's true that Malaysia may be more progressive than Saudi Arabia, it you know one can look at it in a case by case basis. Um, and I think it's important not to shy away from that process because that is a process that in some ways is more difficult. When we are negotiating on legislative uh, drafts, sometimes if you have deep engagement in the process, then there's a lot of low hanging fruit to be plucked. For example, um, because there was political support for the engagement that we had, we were able to bring in section 166A, which is that if an FIR is not filed by the local constable or the local police person for a case of rape or outraging the modesty of a woman or etc., then an FIR can be filed against that police person and they don't, no state sanction is required. Now, the state sanction is very important because usually when there's an offense by a person who is in um, government, that state sanction is like waiting for good if it ever comes. You know? So removal of that state sanction was actually a very important step. And we have found that just citing that provision sometimes gets the FIR registered where they have uh, been reluctant in terms of or whatever, right? Um, of course, the other way of dealing with such patriarchy is through strategic litigation. We are I currently have the marital rape case we also have the case on gay marriage, seeking that marriage between two men or two women be um, constitutionally recognized and all the concomitant rights. Um, an older, you know, a close friend of mine came out to his grandmother, came out to his nanny, and she said, and she was quite shocked, and she said that, oh, okay, and, um, she, when she came around to it, actually quite soon after, she uh, this is after uh, she you know once she understood that this this was in the process of being decriminalized, being gay, uh, section three seventy seven was struck down by a Supreme Court, which was a long and hard fight. She said, uh, <laughs> So, I mean, they don't want people to sort of, you know, run around and have these relationships outside the context of marriage. So I always thought that after decriminalization in our culture, that it would come, uh, that sort of recognizing marriage would come quite fast on the heels of it. Right? Um, 
It's going to be a fight. I mean, we have, you know, the government is opposing us, tooth and nail. They're also opposing us on marital rape, which was a little more surprising to me. Uh, essentially, they are saying that the institution of marriage must be protected, to which our answer is, does the institution of marriage necessarily include rape? Because that's all we're saying, you know? And is it the, the with the currents of rape, you don't seem to have a problem, but you have a problem with the complaining about the rape, you know? Um, with strategic litigation, I think it's very important not to get, to try, can't be guaranteed, to try not to get a bad precedent, because then that occupies the field for a long time. So for example, with our sedition law, when the Supreme Court didn't strike it down um, and only read it down, it's, it's been on the books for a long time and it's cost a lot of people their lives. So I think making sure that the person on the bench is somebody who may appreciate the constitutionality of your arguments, you know? I think that's something that's very important. I mean, you can be Aristotle, and if the person on the bench is somebody who is just not interested, it, it doesn't want to see it, then um, you're a bit stuck. Making sure that you have the right petitioners and the right group of petitioners even. Um, for example, we have a men's group supporting us saying that, in the marital rape case, saying that we want our wives to be able to say no to us because we want to be married to equal partners. And if you take away her right to say no, you also take away her right to say a joyful yes. And this law reduces her to a sexual object and a legal subject. In opposition, we have men's rights associations who are saying that, uh, oh, but it'll be misused and to be misused against us. And as you know, the law, section 420 is misused all the time. I mean, we see it in section 420 is the one on cheating. And we see it misused all the time when there's a contract that was broken and there's no criminal element involved where companies say no, but there was, you know, but you actually cheated me or there was a criminal bre breach of trust. But nobody says anything about that, you know? Um, and where there's misuse, you clamp down on the misuse. So there's no, and there are plenty of laws for it. There's a law on malicious prosecution. If at the beginning, at the outset, that the woman intended to bring, it's a high bar, that the woman intended to bring a case that she knew to be false, right? It's not about not succeeding in your case. Um, so these are a few thoughts, but I would love the opportunity to, uh, to interact with all of you. And that was a particularly long answer to your question. And we focus more on the sexual harassment law, but I'm happy to do it through specific questions. Yes, of course, absolutely. Um, so I think I'll just give the floor to the fellows uh, because they have particular questions with regards to the provision they added to the Act. Uh, especially, I think you spoke about the consent portion when you were talking about the matter of uh, and the definition of it, how you interpret it. I think maybe I'll give the floor to Mona because she has introduced this kind of uh, provision in the Act. Uh, Mona, can you please take the floor? And introduce yourself. Yes, please introduce yourself. Tell me a little bit about you. Um, hello, uh, my name is Mumana Rasool. I'm a final year law student at LUMS and now a fellow uh, with Adil and Sehat. Wow. And I'd like to extend my gratitude on behalf of everybody here that you are here with us uh, and you are providing us with invaluable insight to sexual harassment laws and the legislative drafting. So what Ms. Khushbakht was talking about and what we all went through when we were proposing amendments for the Sexual Harassment at Workplace Act 2010 was that it lacked a comprehensive or even a definition of, of consent, right? So the only time the Act speaks about consent is when it speaks about um, consent of the complainant while giving out evidence. And it does not talk about consent in a particular sexual act. So one thing that we wanted to propose within uh, the amendments of the Act was um, a definition of, the con of, of consent, which describes consent as free from any sort of coercion, as free from any sort of badgering or uh, social pressures, 
um, un, um, like clear consent, which is unequivocal and expressed through clear words and clear actions. And what we were a little confused about is how um, comprehensive, how broad we should go with the definition or how perhaps we should tread it a little carefully so as to ensure that the party, the complainant applying uh, a, a complaint of harassment is well acquainted with the term. And uh, the reason that we want to propose this amendment is so as to ensure that it is very clear for the inquiry committee to um, while they're adjudicating complaints of harassment, they can understand the provision clearly and apply it subsequently and for the uh, complainant while filing a complaint to know whether whatever happened to them fell under that ambit of consent or not. And we would really like to hear your thoughts on, um, on this amendment, if you could please. Look, I think the, the badgering bit is a bit tough, right? Because um, it's the sort of Aziz Ansari case. I don't know if you all remember the Aziz Ansari case. When the Me Too stuff was happening, um, the Aziz Ansari is a fairly well-known comedian in um, the United States, right? And there was a woman who came out and she said that he performed Kanilingus on me and I, without my consent. Um, but he said that, one, you never said no. And two, that you <clears throat> also said, that you said a reluctant yes, but it was a yes, right? Uh, so, under Indian law, the consent has to be unequivocal. This is a very high standard. That it has to be unequivocal, <coughs> equivocating. Can somebody tell me what equivocating means? So equivocating means you're a bit ambivalent, you know, kabhi haan, kabhi na. Right. Now the law says that if it has to be unequivocal, but If she says, nay, 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 right? So there was a case like that, actually. So if she says, nay, 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 I think the clear way to understand it is that you can't think that she's saying no, but she actually means yes, right? If she says yes, but reluctantly, under the law, the letter of the law, that would be that would not constitute adequate consent. To prove that would be incredibly difficult, right? To prove any of that would be incredibly difficult because if she said that I said yes, because there's a question of objective assessment as well as a question of subjective intent, right? So if she says that I said yes, but I wasn't quite sure about it, you know? I mean, I'm just really testing the boundaries of our law here, right? Um, and the man said, but she said yes, you know? And it's actually, there's somebody's going to go to jail for this. It's very serious because you have to have due process. There's such a thing as civil liberties also, you know? Um, then you reach a situation where I can't see any judge convicting the guy, you know? But that's what our law says, okay. If he was badgering her and she said yes, not a yes, but a yes. I think that the criminal law has no role to play here, you know? I'm, uh, I'm happy to hear your disagreement. If he was saying, you know, if he was saying, sending flowers, calling, and then she said, and she was just sick of it, or she, he was just present and she said, yes, you know? Then she may be angry with herself. She may want to change structures in society by which she may want to, she may think his behavior was unfair, 
to keep on and on and on at all. But we are also human beings with free will. You know, and I think it would be incredibly dangerous to take away that conception of free will and make it make the law paternalistic from being violently patriarchal, if you see what I mean. Right? Paternalism comes with a huge, not just one double-edged sword, but a large number of double-edged swords. For example, uh, under the Punjab Excise Act, they didn't want bars to allow women to bartend. Okay, now this went all the way to the Anuj Garg judgment. It's fantastic, you must read it. It went all the way up to the Supreme Court. And what the judgment said is that they brought in the Ruth Wader Ginsburg test of st strict scrutiny, this is the Indian Supreme Court, uh, of st strict scrutiny, saying that even when a legislation uh, or uh, any governmental action appears to be something that is um, beneficial to women, that you have to look at it in a strict way to see that is it in fact benefiting, you know? Or is it in fact like restricting their right, rights and saying that, you know, you just stay at home uh, and be safe over there. So the, the movements in 2012, after the young women's, you know, the Nirbhaya's uh, uh, violent rape and killing, there was a huge focus on that. The slogan was Bekhoff Azadi, you know, stepping away from the idea that I need to be protected to the idea that I need to be free. So not let my husband or brother or whatever keep me in my home, but the state must make sure that I, as a citizen, am free to take a walk in the middle of the night if I feel like it. You know? Um, I don't know if that answers your question. Of course, the definition of um, consent is here. And I will have, I, either I or uh, Junior will send it to you. Uh, but it's there. I Have you been using it? We've been proposing amendments uh, right now, Abhi, to okay. be introduced within the law, but the law currently does not address consent as a term. No, as I a understand, but have you looked at the Indian law in order to sort of just take ideas? You know, I don't know if you can um, to cite it, but I've cited the Pakistani marital rape, uh, you know, issue in our court. But, and you might be surprised, you know, because I think that there's also an understanding in many of our decision makers, that the I, that it comes from the same place. The IPC is, you know, was identical. In many ways, it's still identical. You know, so if one country is doing something, it's useful to at least look at it. But anyway, that's the call you have to take, depending on who your decision maker is. But just for for your own ideas, I think it would be useful to just look at that definition of consent. You know, and see which bits you want to use and which bits you don't want to use. Yeah, no, I think that's very interesting. And we are uh, at the moment looking at uh, cross jurisdictional uh, policies, um, UK, India, Bangladesh, all of that as well. But what you've said has kind of struck with me the line, this very fine line to, that we have to tread on between paternal, making the law paternalistic and ensuring that we don't revoke everybody's free will. So that's a thought that we definitely will further through in our amendments. And thank you for such an informative and comprehensive response. So um, thank you. Thank you so much, Momina. And thank you so much uh, for answering the question. Now, I think uh, because you spoke about the Indian jurisprudence and the Indian Act, I would want uh, Mania Rifat to um, ask you, uh, give her an opportunity to ask you questions because she did a proper thorough research. She was assigned the Indian law um, and that she had to look at it. So Mania, uh, you have the floor. No, also ask me about sexual harassment because I know that many of you were focusing on that. And um, so that might be a useful discussion as well. You know? So, so thank you, firstly. Thank you so much, Ms. Nandi, for such an intellectually enriching um, discussion. It was very insightful and we're absolutely honored to have you with us. Um, Miss, I came across an extremely inspirational clause in the Indian legislation, which is the 
protection against sexual harassment at the Workplace Act 2013 that talks so that people who make it to the inquiry committee need to have either experience of commitment to women's issues or some legal knowledge on the matter of harassment. How do you evaluate the on-ground efficiency of this clause? And how is India successful in achieving this level of gender sensitivity that is required by the act? And how can we take inspiration from it? Uh, prior to 1997, when the Vishakha judgment came, making illegal sexual harassment at the workplace after a woman called Bhavri Devi was working on the ground as a satin which is to prevent child marriage, she was doing social work. Uh, she was raped. Um, the Supreme Court said that sexual harassment in the workplace is illegal and that you must have uh, inquiry committees within the workplace and it's illegal not to, right? That was a big step. The 2013 legislation is also important, but honey, I'm afraid that there's a huge number of problems, right? One is that um, well, first, let me talk about what's good. First, let me talk about what's good, because I think too often we forget to um, emphasize that and leverage that enough. So section 19 of the act requires that you have workshops in all the workplaces that have employees of 10 people or more, right? So that these workshops actually can be amazing. And I have personally done a few of them for some of the bigger companies, for Penguin Random House, for example. Like I've done a few workshops for them. And I've also done um, some for Bertelsmann. And you have these transformative moments, you know? Like if they're done properly, then you have these eyes shining moments where people realize that it's not that it's, if I say that somebody's hot to my colleague, right? I may think it's a compliment. I may think it's not a big deal if I'm a man. But that's not what she's here for. And there are lots of studies that demonstrate that um, commenting on a woman's appearance causes her to have less opportunities for promotion, less money if she is promoted, and whether it's negative or positive. So this huge debate happened around the time that Obama called, said to Kamala Harris that not only is she the most brilliant attorney general, he said that, okay, she's also the most attractive. Now this is very interesting to me because she was a good friend of his also. So it's not that he was just saying it out of the blue. She was also a good friend of his, both the, both the couples were good friends. He was just, he just said it. So the internet was very much divided at the time about whether what he said was sexist or whether it wasn't. And at the time, I then looked into the research and found this, that if you say in the public domain, in the context of a woman's work, right? If you say that, if, you, if he was saying it in his drawing room, it would have been one thing, but he said it publicly to the whole world, either that she's attractive or that she's not attractive, in fact, it's interesting, or that she's not attractive. You know, that it impinges on her political election, professional advancement, depending on what sphere she's in. There was a case called Anne Hopkins versus PricewaterhouseCoopers in the United States, where there was a woman who was a partner in, um, or who was up for partner in PricewaterhouseCoopers. She had very short hair um, and she was a big rainmaker. She was very successful. And when the issue was looked at the fact why, of why she wasn't being promoted, some of the people, some of the white men who were responsible for promoting her said, but she never wore earrings. You know, that's interesting to me. They said she never wore earrings. Then there's this other case of a man who dismissed his a dentist, I think he was, and he dismissed his secretary again in the United States because she was too attractive. And he said, 
He said, it's not you, it's me. And he said, you're too attractive. I can't deal with it. You know? So where, so what do you have to do? You have to not be too manly and you have to not be too attractive. So this is a double bind that women can't find themselves in a position in being when they're just going to work and exercising their minds and their, um, you know, hearts. And it affects the companies or the workplace places bottom line, right? Because then you're not the person that you have hired. You're not getting the best effort from them. What you're getting is this kind of like crazy. And we know that this is true because we all have to navigate it at some point or the other. You're getting this ridiculous sort of uh, structure that the person has to navigate in addition to being better than the next person because that's what it takes, right? In these workshops, we have the men speak and the men say what it is about patriarchy and the structure of the gender structures and the boxes that we're all placed into that affects them. Some have come out and said that, you know, when my mother was hit or when my father gave her, you know, five rupees at one stage or 300 rupees at the other to buy a handbag and she really had to ask. So from one extreme, which is she's being beaten to another extreme that there was this kind of little drip system of giving money that she was entitled to, right? Um, and how they hated it to people saying that actually I wanted to be a designer, but I was forced to be an engineer, to saying that I can't deal with this pressure to keep making money, to saying that I really want to uh, have a much bigger role in taking care of my kids. I mean, I had children for a reason. I want to, you know, I want to be a father. I don't just want to come in and out or whatever. And then we have the women speak about their experiences and we find that the men listen much more carefully in that, in that space. And I think there's the realization that it's not about women's rights, it is about gender rights. It is about all of us being placed in boxes that we should not be in. It's about uh, men being brutalized in a way. Ronamat, uh, you know, ladke ho, you have to be tough. Um, and that is socialization, that to break out of that. And I think that once we come to that, we also come to the rules and the laws and there has to be an internal policy. And we say that, look, this is the internal policy. At the first instance, you have to say no. And this, Momina, comes to your point, right? Is that you have to, you have to say no. Um, it can also be, per se, sexual harassment. Because say you don't know what to say then. Or say the person is more powerful than you and he keeps telling you you're hot. You know, and then you're uncomfortable and you're, you're treading that fine line between not alienating them and um, trying to get your work done and trying to keep your dignity, you know, that they have assaulted in a sense, right? Um, but once we tell them that, look, the company is behind you, okay, and that you are helping the company by doing this, that really helps. Because now with the Me Too movements all around the world, there's reputational and particularly with the foreign companies, I think, but also with others, there's the reputational worry of, is it going to be, uh, is my reputation going to be destroyed in the media, right? There is the worry of legal proceedings. You know, or there should be more worry, but there is still, there's some worry that has come with that. I don't know what the situation is in Pakistan, but in India, in the formal sector, more than, way more than the informal sector. In the informal sector, I don't think there's any worry. Um, that concern has come, you know? Um, and then, of course, you have the Internal Complaints Committee, where the Internal Complaints Committee has this, as uh, Hania was saying, that there is the independent person that is meant to be there, and you there's a adjudication process where you decide. And I think, you know, what I always encourage is that let everything be complained of. And if it's a small thing, it will be, if you can't deal with it at your own level, if you can't, if it's being kicked up and your supervisor can't deal with it, you make that complaint, even if it's a small thing. Because 
then it will be dealt with and if it's a small thing there will be a warning na so it's not that the person is going to be suspended or fired every time something happens if as i was speaking in the same example he said she was hot there will be a warning and perhaps an apology one difficulty that i found is that hania the it's stacked it's the internal complaints committees are <coughs> stacked in favor of the company okay now in favor of the company usually means in favor of the senior person more senior person you know which means usually in there's something in favor of the harasser um there's some bias in favor of the harasser the second thing is that the person who's bringing in the external expert is the company the company has vicarious liability you want to protect the company so the incentive structure is and i think this is something for you you all to look out for as you make your law you know you want to make sure that that is not there um i think kushbak had mentioned the local the uh, area complaints committees and those have hardly been set up i mean it breaks my heart to sort of tell you this because this is something i was so optimistic about but those have mostly not been set up and i think those are really important because if you think that the your internal complaints committee is going to be biased you have to have an option you know what i keep training these companies to to understand is that look there are two ways to deal with the problem one is to brush it under the carpet the second is to address it front and center now a lot of companies have started addressing it front and center because if you don't don't forget that the criminal law is always there section 509 words or gestures that outrage the modesty of a woman you know words right and i think that can be the stick that makes the makes them sort out their in house sort of um dealing yes so um thank you thank you hania for your question and uh, again thank you for answering it so i'll be very mindful of your time also um, i think we spoke about the fact that you will be you have to leave for uh, your vaccination so i'll just ask you if you have five more minutes to talk about uh, for sure so i think i'll just give the floor to uh, bilal who will join us from uh, the in person venue here um, he has a question and then maybe we can uh, with this and this permission if we can take another question or we can just uh, you know, wrap up and we will definitely want uh, in like the uh, advice from for all our fellows in my support uh, hello ms kamal and i thank you so much for this opportunity uh, you're such an amazing experience i have an echo bilal i'm not sure why i am do you want to type your question until you sort that out and then we can have a discussion without the echo you can type it in the chat Uh, I'll type it if if the oh, no, great still exists. Great. Okay, okay. So basically, um, uh, within the Indian Act, there is an option of the local committee mechanism. Yeah. However, in the Pakistani Act, uh, the complainants don't actually have that option, where, uh, and they only have two options: either through the inquiry committee that has to exist within the organization, okay. uh, which is only usually in the formal sector. or the ombuds person that does not have a lot of offices mm-hmm. so there subsequently there's a lot of issues of implementation access of the access of justice and the uh, act actually fails to uh, provide the option of local committees such as india so mm-hmm. i just wanted to get your opinion of why do you think gaps in implementation do exist and what can be done to solve these and do you think this is an il- illustration of the failure of the state to prioritize confronting and preventing gender based violence of course they don't care <laughs> like, um one thing that i've seen in india in terms of the uh, uh can i be heard yes ma'am we can hear you No, you know one thing i've seen in terms of india is that there's a lot of now and i think it's a good thing there's a lot of lip service that is now paid to uh women's rights right like now it's become an issue that is um that elections are fought over you know um and we don't fail to bring it up uh 
बहुत ना, बहुत हुआ ना, नारी परिवार अब की बार मोदी सरकार राइट बट इन टर्म्स ऑफ एक्चुअल वर्क जस्ट नॉट इनफ इज डन वाई बिकॉज द पेट्रियाल सिस्टम दैट वो हैव ऑलवेज बीन देर आर स्टिल देर सो I think that one thing systematically if it was done for all bills would really help implementation of these laws right which is that if you cost the bill and this is something that I uh, uh, uh sort of conducted a workshop for on behalf of the UN of uh, all the different south asia governments including pakistan uh, in the context of the juvenile justice act now we had bangladesh india afghanistan everybody was there and we were working on this because if you cost a new law or even an old law since like many are not being um, implemented and you say that okay to make this a reality what is required and you have everyone sitting there whether it's the police the home ministries the justice department the courts you know and saying that look i need training i need more women officers i need more tables and chairs i need funds to build buildings or to rent space um then people get really invested in it also and you also get their input on how to make the thing work before it becomes law ideally and i think that is something that leads much more inevitably to to a, a law being implemented um the pillar rights are very frequently not given they must be taken you know and and i'm just so delighted to see some men here as well um because i think we recognize that these rights impact all of us but also you know we have litigation in the supreme court in our supreme court to implement laws also so that's another way by the way yeah because there was medha kothwal vishakha was being implemented but it wasn't being implemented in the same way that it was required and then there was the medha kothwal case that i was a part of um where all the state governments were respondents and all the state governments had to come and periodically explain why and then the law was coming the legislation was coming so they dropped the case so that's another way to do it to bring you know to cite uh judgments from various jurisdictions and say that look it's not being implemented and in your constitutional mandate this is a part of it you know i mean it depends on your courts app your constitutional courts appetite to uh conduct continuing mandamus our courts appetite has gone down a lot on that they see it as a unfair incursion into the government's domain but i think that if your if rights are not being implemented then how is it unfair then it's something that has to be done we can take one more question yes so i think ali anwar has typed this question in the chat so ali anwar can you please uh, unmute yourself and please ask a question first of all thank you ma'am for the insightful session so far i have been greatly enjoying this so i'll cut it short uh, i was uh, trying to ask that despite the existence of laws we still see that gender based violence is quite rampant and is happening pretty much everywhere around the world do you think we need stricter legislation that brings around penalties as a deterrence or do we need to approach using awareness and sensitization campaigns in essence what i mean to ask is is the problem stemming from criminal deviation of sorts or is it more from the inability to understand that other people have comfort zones and personal spaces and individuality what is your take on it? big question one is on the stricter penalties those don't work you have to have a penalty that fits the crime whenever something bad happens in india the politicians say that oh death penalty the death penalty should be used you know that comes at the last stage is the easiest thing to say it's even the, an easy thing to do with the stroke of a pen does that change anything no in fact it will deter judges from convicting in this way the second thing is that there are studies from georgia in the united states which demonstrate that the introduction of the death penalty for crimes like uh, rape and murder 
actually increased. There was a hardening effect. Um, and those violent crimes actually increased. Other data demonstrates that there is no impact, right? But this data actually said that the crimes increased, there was a hardening effect. How do you demonstrate that by killing someone, uh, you know, by killing someone that killing is bad, right? Like, it makes no sense. Um, the problem is, so there was a study, there was a UN study across Asia that showed that a lot of people raped out of a sense of fun, okay? That they saw, if you look at what was happening in the Nirbhaya case, like one of the most brutal rapes that have come to light in this region, right? Um, they had sort of commandeered a bus and they'd had some, you know, tandoori chicken and they were drinking. Right. And they themselves had been like hugely brutalized as children. And they were doing it out of a sense of fun. So it's that idea that the other person is not a full human like you, you know, that they are a object to cater to, cater to your uh, desires. So yes, strict enforcement of law is absolutely vital. But at the same time, behavior change, making sure that from the primary school level, as well as running behavior change campaigns through various other means is something that is undertaken in a focused and directed and way in which you measure the attitudes prior and the attitudes post is vital. Now, we've done it with anti-smoking campaigns, right? Anti-smoking campaigns around the world, there are lots of hugely successful examples. Now, violence against women is not the same. It's more deeply embedded, it's different. Um, But there are lots of examples of success in poorer communities, in richer communities, there are lots of examples of success. And for example, in a slum in Bombay, the children were, went through one of these workshops and came out of it much more likely to say that both my mother and my father should be washing the dishes, for example, right? Um, and that sort of thing. So I think that the time really to, we, to root out patriarchy and for us all to be seen as equal citizens in our variety, right? Regardless of what our religion is, regardless of what our status in society is, regardless of how rich or poor we are, regardless of whether we are trans women or uh, cis women, you know, is something that is vital and the time was not yesterday. The time is not tomorrow. I mean, the time really is now. Because there have been centuries of this stuff going on and we've been tinkering around the edges of patriarchy. And we all need to come together to get rid of it. If you have the time, look at my Wu Manifesto, which is a six point program that according to me, if implemented, uh, gets rid of patriarchy. Um, it's something that we were trying to get political parties to sign on to during the 2014 election so that it could be a basic standard on which the political parties agree and hold each other to, to account, you know, regardless of who wins in parliament. Um, the Congress signed up, the Ahmadmi party signed up. Unfortunately, the BJP did not, primarily actually because of 377, um, because of the, but also because they said that they had their own 
view on uh, view on this stuff. So, so yes, it is a political effort. It is a legal, legislative, as well as a litigative effort, and it is very significantly also a societal effort. We know what to do. It's not rocket science. We just need to do it. Absolutely. So um, thank you so much, Ms. Nandeep, for being here, for again graciously agreeing to be a part of the Nurset Project Mentorship Program and speaking to the fellows. Uh, you know, I would just like to end it uh, in, you know, by saying that uh, we, you know, we always give importance to, you know, lawyers who are, you know, they're competent and we measure competence by, let's say, they know all the laws and they are intellectual and they can, you know, come up with great strategies. Uh, which are, you know, equally important to you know, have a successful career. But uh, I've seen, you know, I've followed you um, since, since some between two years now. So you have focused a lot on, you know, on every platform you say that there is, um, import, it is important that us lawyers take responsibility also to bring reform, social legal reform in the society. And I think we did a tech talk also on the contagion of goodness. Uh, so, how, please, if you could, you know, just give advice to our fellows, the 12 fellows who are here. Uh, they are extremely competent and very intellectually curious. Uh, but the good thing and the assessment criteria that they set out was also that, you know, they are, they understand the plight of women, they are passionate, they are compassionate also, and they all want to collectively make a change. So, um, what do you think as a lawyer, how do we instill that practice and what, what if any advice you have for me? That. I mean, I'd be preaching to the converted, right? <laughs> because the fellows that are here are, are there because you know in your guts that we are all interconnected. That we are interconnected as men and women and intersex and trans people. That we are interconnected as poor and rich. We are interconnected as Pakistanis and as Indians, you know? And that interconnection means that when you have grief, but that grief, even if I ha harden myself to, somewhere will impact me because I've hardened myself to it, you know? As lawyers, we can choose to look at black letter law, you know, do only do contracts all day, or we can choose to use the power that we have to leave this world a better, happier, more equal, more flourishing place that we found it. I think South Asian women in particular, and largely speaking, our generation, <laughs> because it has to be a very large sort of bracket because I'm at one end and you're really at the other. Um, I think the women have been raised to be tough as well as to be nurturing. And that's a lot of pressure, but you know, it comes with the advantage that many of us have all of those abilities, you know? Um, and so let's, and, and I think that some of the men have not had the same support to understand how to navigate this patriarchal world and, you know, and to navigate feminism. And the men who are here, you clearly have found a way to navigate it yourself. You know? Now, I think finding ways to maximizing the unleashing of that collective power is our collective task. And we always must remember that the arc of the moral universe may be long, but it bends towards justice, as Martin Luther King said. It's been a real pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. Thank you so much again, Ms. Karuna Nandi. It was a beautiful session, and we cannot thank you enough for this. Um, so I think you can now leave for the vaccination, because that's also extremely important. Uh, but again, extremely, extremely grateful uh, for this wonderful session. And again, I would say, you know, I again have to pinch myself because I'm still a bit shaky right now. <laughs> but uh, wonderful, wonderful meeting you. Thank you so much. Thank you and more power to you all. <laughs>